So we had quite a bit of interest in the panel and the presentations this morning. Thank you to all our viewers and of course to the excellent panelists. Um, in no particular order, I will ask the questions. And this was from Vanda, who is from Guyana, who first commended the speakers as I do um, about the interesting perspectives and the answering of questions on res re resolving sexuality and religion. But she wants to know, is there any strategy um, that can be adopted to secure LGBT rights in the Caribbean? Um, and her focus was on Guyana, but I think it's something that we can broaden. What was the strategy, for example, used in Belize and Trinidad that any of the panelists here can see to use um, to support and stand up for LGBT rights against homophobia and to ensure legislation is passed to enshrine the fundamental human rights to sexual orientation in the constitution and law. So it's a very broad question, but um, I don't know if any panelist would like to tackle that one. What is the strategy that civil society could use in the Caribbean and Ghana specifically to effectively support and stand up against homophobia and to ensure a legislation is passed to enshrine fundamental human rights to sexual orientation in our constitutions and in our law. I open it up to anyone who wants to take a stab at that. Okay. Um, go ahead. Okay, thank you. Um, in Miridom's case, for years, I have been looking at what has been happening, especially within the Eastern Caribbean, where there are a lot of groupings and a lot of meetings of people speaking about um, the rights of homosexuals and gay people and the government's response to it. And I realized that the government and the, so especially evangelical Christians, are really treating it as if it were a joke. That... LGBT people were really some kind of fantasy, something that some people were making up. They never existed in the society. So in order to address it, I found that there was one day I went into a meeting and I just thought, I'm not coming to one of those meetings to say the same thing and go back to islands and don't do anything. Mm -hmm. And that is why I decided to hit it head on by asking the bishop, what is their position on it? Because I've been reading things about some of the things that the Catholic Church have been saying at the United Nations and at the Vatican. And being brought up a Christian myself within the Christian, within the Catholic Church, I was wondering what is the whole position of love? The love that they preach, the Bible that they speak about. Is it about hating people because they didn't follow the exact line that they're towing? So I decided to ask that question. And from that, the time the bishop responded to me, I was happy that he did because it gave me the fuel to bring it further. And that's why I decided to bring it to the courts. Because there is no way that any, if you ask people in the, my community, what is it that makes people hate homosexuals that much? And they will tell you first thing is that the Bible says so, and it's against the law. And that is the end of the discussion. So I just decided to deal with the two of them and finish there. Thanks, Daryl. I don't know if anybody else can think yes, of I, I, I'm thinking that um, I, in, in the context of, of Guyana and some implications for the Caribbean, I think this is a matter of education, uh, legal system, and uh, political interference or, or political will. Um, politically, politicians are, are kept relevant by a group of people. And, and the majority, especially in the Caribbean and Ghana, the majority of those people are Christians. And Christians are the one who's saying, well, this is illegal, this is not right, this is immoral. So a politician uh, maintenance in office is dependent on, on his Christian um, supporters who are against this sort of, of education. I don't even think it's, it's an issue of morality. Uh, I think it's an issue of education. 
And so because the church is more static and believe that sexuality is um, though it should be something private, um, they have made it uh, a political issue uh, as well as a global issue. I think politically, uh, politicians are not willing to embrace this because it, it doesn't uh, augur as well for their, their continuance in office. I think um, in order to push this, uh, they have to be legal, uh, le a legal way forward. I think that's the only path that is possibly available where uh, we believe that the legal system is just and fair and progressive and take into consideration all aspects of society. I think that's the only clear path going forward. Um, however, there will still be pushbacks. And I think education is the key in having people understand that even you, who, who do not support the LGBT community, you are also going through um, sexual changes. Uh, your sexual preference as a teenager or as a young adult is no longer the same as an adult. And, 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 and the church needs to move away from the fact that all, all things sexual is taboo. And I think that's where the suppression really is because human sexuality is, is not an open stuff, it's suppressed. It's something uh, that, yeah, God has blessed us with sexuality. God has, God wants us to have sex, but this thing has been captured by the devil and therefore it's no longer good. So I think education, the legal system and political uh, will is, is the only way forward uh, in, in, in the combat. But I think the movement of human sexuality will never be stifled. Our society is progressive. Uh, either you get on, on board voluntarily or involuntarily, but you can't stop it. It's going to come. Oh, thank you. I would, I would like to add to that. Um, while I, I echo a lot of what uh, Mr. Lane said, as one of the leaders um, of the LGBTQ community in Guyana, um, I am a part of the premier LGBTQ organization, Sasod Guyana. I can safely say, yes, education is needed. And um, over the years, we have tried different methods in getting this done. And I can tell you from where Sasod began 17 years ago to where we are now, it's a big progress. Before we could not even mention being LGBTQ out in public to now where people stop and listen, organizations reach out to us for more information on understanding gender and sexual diversity, to having conversations with the church on um, how to bridge the gap between the LGBTQ community and, and uh, the church. Also in terms of, of um, the constitutional aspects, Sasa Guyana continues to engage every possible government channel. We um, also use our international engines, the OAS, the UN, and so on to highlight the struggles and, and the challenges of the um, community in Guyana. Uh, currently, we are engaging the new government on um, LGBTQ uh, human rights issues. Uh, we had a really good uh, relationship with the, previous, with the previous government and we were able to get things done. Um, earlier in my presentation, I would have mentioned um, the Prevention of Discrimination Act. Uh, Guyana has one of the best um, Prevention of Discrimination Acts there is, but it is void of four words, sexual orientation, gender identity, and gender expression. We are hoping that with this new dispensation, we will be able to include these four words. I will just Thank you. close. Yeah, I will just close by saying it's all about education. 
and taking time to understand. Thank you, Valini. Um, very important points. I always use the phrase, eradicate hate, educate. And this is a very um, poignant thing to end on. Um, I have one more question for Luke, um, whose very powerful presentation affected a lot of us, I think. Um, and the question is from Sharon Motley. As we wait for this rest of the society to catch up, can you speak to the role of groups, NGOs, etc., cetera, um, as providing safe spaces for our youth and what support is required to formalize these groups, spaces, or institutions? Yeah. Uh, thank you so much, Sharon, for, for participating and, and asking your question. Um, you know, I think in the similar ways that LGBT organizations want other organizations uh, to, particularly the religious organizations, to kind of appreciate our full humanity, I think NGOs and LGBT um, civil society organizations need to appreciate the full spiritual humanity of, of, of all their people. Uh, so for so many of us who've experienced this kind of you know, spiritual wounding, I think spiritual healing is important. And so therefore that should be incorporated in how we do our organizing work. I remember when we had uh, the Pride Week of Celebrations, uh, Father Harvey came across to do a particular session on religion and, LGB and LGBTQ persons. I think it was Father Harvey, you know, Lee Clark and somebody else, uh, Shelley and Tanya maybe, I can't remember. But the point was, Father Harvey was saying that if your religious institution is a homophobic and difficult space for you, then there is nothing stopping you from creating your own space. Now, in our minds, we thought that I was just crazy. But in actuality, God does not only belong to some people. Fellowship does not only belong to some people. And so we began to think genuinely about how do we create LGBT uh, spiritual spaces where we can invite other, other religious leaders to come in if they see so fit, but spaces for us where we can enjoy our whole humanity, which includes our spirituality. Something I think Jamaica would have been doing is I think we followed their, uh, their example. They had a kind of roving uh, LGBT church that we were looking at. Uh, thanks, thanks, Sharon. Thank you very much, Luke. Um, and I was hoping that Reverend Pat would have been able to join us. I'm not seeing her. Um, Hi, I'm back. Okay. I, I'm, I'm sorry, my internet is so poor and I'm bounced off several times. I'm very sorry. My presentation got a little messed up too. No worries, no worries. So I don't know if you had anything to add to what Vanda asked, which is how do you think that... Um, we can more vigorously and effectively support and stand up against homophobia and getting legislation passed to enshrine the fundamental human rights of sexual orientation in our constitution and law in Guyana specifically, but in the Caribbean more broadly. Well, well, thanks a lot. And thanks, Amanda, for that question. Um, I, I think the presentations were really great. And um, I'd like to add that um, it, be more helpful to have better engagement of uh, faith communities and the church in particular with um, LGBT um, organizations and persons. One of the things that has worked for us uh, in the in our work with the Ghana Presbyterian Church is um, is is our work together, like against suicide, in terms of um, um, youth um, issues and bringing youth and persons from LGBT organizations together with those of the church to listen and to hear each other. I do believe that we have to apply our um, minds and our hearts uh, um, to 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 have a change and to galvanize a movement um, in Guyana across the Caribbean. Thank you. Um, if, I could, if I could add, um, uh, I, I've been listening and one of the issues that we have in the Bahamas in particular is that we've reached out um, consecutively to um, the Christian Council in particular, like I said. So um, this past um, October, we would have conducted the first, first virtual um, Pride um, celebrations here in the Bahamas, right? Um, and I was working with um, Alexis DeMarco, who is one of one of the leading um, activists here 
um, um, and we um, I, we worked along with several other activists, but we, we, we attempted to engage the church in dialogue. Um, and a lot of the pastors that we reached out to just flat out refused. And so the issue here is that, um, uh, as Telford would have said, um, um, I think, that um, we've had to go on without um, a lot of their support. Because if, they, if someone's not willing to engage you in a conversation, there's nothing that you can pretty, pretty much do until they're ready. Um, we've sent letters, we've sent emails. Um, however, they are willing to protest against them. They are willing to stand up and say, um, or um, um, they are willing to go to um, and speak into the airs of the prime ministers and the, and the ministers who they may be acquainted with. And so in the Bahamas, the situation is a bit different because we've reached out. We want to have dialogue, right? We're trying to, um, to, to be that bridge, but they don't want to, they, they don't even want to meet us at the bridge. And so like, that's a big issue for us because we're not going to be held hostage um, 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 to get ignorance. And we cannot be held hostage to the fact that you don't understand us. Like, and, and, and we're reaching out. And so in those cases, like, um, um, if, if you are experiencing that, I would say that you have to continue to plow on ahead. And when people catch up, they'll catch on to the wave. And, the, uh, you know, um, 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 uh, is it similar to sometimes how um, LGBT people come out the closet and they, they begin to live their lives without the affirmation, without the support of, the, of their uh, um, um, blood family? Um, they join you later down the course. And if they never join you, you know, you can just you just extend that olive branch. The olive branch is always there, and that's something that we've just had to you know make up in our mind. Um, we're going to continue to reach out, but we're not waiting for you. Um, I, I echo the same sentiments of help, but the trains keep moving. Thank you very much. Um, I have one more question for Eddie Green, and um, I'm not sure if Eddie is still on, Professor Green. Yes, I'm on. Good. We have a question from Sharon Motley to you. Having been part of the HIV movement in the Caribbean through PANCAP and CARICOM, what parallels do you see that work with governments? Um, yeah. Well, thank you very much. Um, I think that um, I wanted to let those who have been working on the ground deal with the issue. And one disappointment I had in the discussions that no one who spoke uh, on this panel, except me, referred to what I consider to be a movement that had paved the way for the, the connection between um, faith leaders and LGBTQ communities. Yesterday, I think we had a presentation from Kenneth Gard Minot about Jamaica and how the melding of those two helped in a, in a way, not necessarily to change laws, but help to create an understanding for moving forward. And I just wanted to say, since the, the thing was on strategy, what strategies have been used? I think that we need necessarily to, um, to build on what has happened because the parliamentarians, the regional parliamentarians are on record, chaired by the current, um, the, the current minister of justice for Jamaica. He's the chair of the Caribbean parliamentary groups for anti-discrimination. And that group in 2018 declared that it would support the legislation going forward, the parliamentary group for the Caribbean. Now that has not been translated nationally. Secondly, it is important to note that the Caribbean Faith Leaders Steering Group of which Garth Minot is chair, um, and Bishop, um, Bishop Wright of, of Belize is on that. Um, and also the, the Catholic um, Justice Program is a member of that and the Evangelic Movement of Trinidad and Tobago. And that, in, that, that agreement with the faith leaders was for moving forward with the abolition of laws that discriminate. That is on the books. And indeed, what has happened with the Faith Leaders Group is that they have incorporated a representative of LGBTQ on the steering committee. Now, what I'm saying is, well, why hasn't this worked? And I think from the distance that I have now, it hasn't worked because it has not been implemented on the ground. The same synergies have not been created, developed, and implemented. I know that in Jamaica, Mr. Telford Lane is active, okay? Um, 
And I, I think that by now, we would have in Guyana and elsewhere, mm -hmm. as in Jamaica, moved in the direction. I think I've spoken long enough just to indicate that at the regional level, there has been movement, but that has not necessarily been translated at the national level. Thank you very Mr. much. Mr. Green, all of the people that you mentioned who are on the steering committee to get this synergizing done are all people who oppose the repeal of the anti buggery laws. So I'm not too sure where it is going, but I could tell you that I have had two meetings with, I have possibly had two meetings with the cabinet of Dominica. And although I go in there and I speak to the people and they understand what is the situation that they're dealing with, my last question to them is, know that I'm satisfied that you understand what is it that LGBTQ people are facing. Why don't you do something about it? And they remind me that they're politicians. They have to pander to their voters. And if that's not what they want, they cannot lose an election just because they want to push this thing forward. And they invite me kindly to go out to speak with the community mm -hmm. to try to change their minds about it. Mm -hmm. And every step that I take for me to deal with those situations from the people who make decisions, it ends up that it is leadership by consensus and not leadership by what is right. Yeah, um, that, that's the issue. The same issue applies here in the Bahamas. Um, we've been told by numerous of pastors in the, back, um, in, in, in the behind the scenes and even politicians, they would love to, but it, 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 um, they're governing by convenience and consensus. And so if, 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 if the people don't speak to it, they're not pushing the issue because they don't want to put their political careers, even though many of them are already dead. Um, um, they don't want to put them, they don't want to put those um, um, on the chopping block. So they'll tell you behind the scenes, well, you know, I have, I, I have gay brothers and sisters, or I am um, LGBTQ, but I'm not going to put my head on the chopping block for this issue. And that's the issue that we face here. Like yeah. they, 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 they won't go, they won't go past that. So I agree with um, Mr. Fuller. Thank you all. Um, this is very exciting and we could continue this <laughs> conversation, but we have a panel coming up from Asia and it is near 1 a.m. there now when we have two people who have been very <laughs> diligent in staying awake. So we're going to skip the break and go straight now to the panel from Asia. So thank you, panelists, and I will turn it back over to Clifford. Yes, thank you all. That was a marvellous question and answer. It was nice to have some questions. Uh, I have to say that the, uh, the, the, the Christian right here have been making similar thre threats to government that they won't vote for them. So uh, who knows what's going to happen? So we move on. Um, to we, we move to Asia. Wonderful. Uh, our first speaker is the Reverend Christopher Rajkumar, who is the Presbyter of the Church of North India. Uh, welcome, Christopher. Christopher. 